All right, welcome. So in this video, I wanna talk about Turing reductions. So I'm gonna start by talking about what we know as the halting problem, which was the first problem that Turing actually showed was undecidable. We showed a different one, ATM. We're now gonna show that halt TM or the halting problem is undecidable. It's very closely related to the language that we already looked at, ATM. Uh, in this case, we get an encoding of a machine and a uh, string, but now all we care about is that the machine halts on the string, not whether it accepts or rejects. So very similar language. We can probably see why if ATM is undecidable, halt, halt TM or the halting problem is also going to be undecidable. So one way we could prove this is we could follow what we've already done and what Turing did and use diagonalization, and that would be a direct proof. And again, it wouldn't be too far a step from what we've already done. Um, but we can also indirectly show that it is uh, undecidable using what we know as a Turing reduction. So I'm gonna show you how this idea works by just running us through the proof that halt TM is going to be undecidable, the idea here is we're going to use uh, this machine. So in this case, I'm starting out to say, assume that it is decidable. Again, this is very much like we would do in a diagonalization proof. We're trying to get a contradiction here. So let's just assume that halt TM is decidable. And then it, let's assume that there is some machine that decides it. In this case, I'm going to call it H. And then what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and build another machine. In this case, our goal is we're going to try and build a machine for ATM. We already know that ATM is undecidable. That's what's going to make this indirect. We're going to use ATM to help us uh, prove this. Um, and we're going to try and show that if halt TM was decidable, then we can build a machine that would decide ATM that will get our contradiction for us. So our machine's going to look a little bit like this. So again, our, the goal of this machine is to decide ATM. So it's going to have the same input structure as ATM, which is an M and W. It turns out to be the same input structure that we have for our machine H. Now, the way we're going to use this is in a fairly straightforward way. Um, we want to decide ATM. The reason why we couldn't decide ATM before is because we couldn't tell if a machine was going to halt or not. Well, we have a machine here now, H, that can tell us when a machine will halt or not. So let's just go ahead and run H on M and W. It's either going to accept saying, yeah, it will halt, or it will reject and say it's going to run forever. So if it rejects, we're going to reject because that's the troubling case for us. But if it accepts, then all we have to do is go ahead and simulate M on W because if H accepts, it's telling us that M is gonna halt on W. So we know this step won't run forever. We can just simulate M on W until it halts. And then given that it's going to halt, we just accept or reject as it does. Now we decide ATM. And that's, that's sort of the takeaway here is we can see that M1 halts on all of our inputs. I argued that here, that our machine is gonna halt because H halts on all inputs and then M if we get to this step, must halt because H told us that it would. And then this means that the machine that we've, we've created here, M1, actually decides ATM. It's not just a recognizer. Now that's our contradiction. ATM is undecidable, so halt TM must also be undecidable. Now what we've kind of done here, and this is, this is uh, what, what we've built here, is sort of a reduction in the sense we've shown how ATM could be solved if we had a decider or a solution to halt TM. It turns out it's impossible to decide either of them, but we've shown here that if we had a decider for one, we could build the decider for the other, and this is what we're gonna call a reduction. So the, halt prob the halting problem and ATM have a very uh, close re coupled relationship because they're very similar problems. Let's look at a slightly different problem that's maybe a further step away that's going to allow us to engage in the idea of a reduction in a little bit more detail. So in this case, I've, got, I've defined a new language called ETM, which is the empty term, uh, E for empty. So here it, we just take an encoding of an, a machine M. Um, and we're going to argue that this machine accepts, or rather, we're going to accept this machine if this machine accepts no string. We're going to look at this language ETM for empty Turing machine that takes an encoding of a Turing machine, and we accept that Turing machine only if that Turing machine accepts no string, so that the language of this Turing machine is empty set. There's nothing in there. So can we tell 
uh, by, by giving an encoding of a Turing machine if it's going to end up accepting no strings. So let's go ahead and show that this happens to be an undecidable language. We can't actually do this in a decidable way. So our strategy, we're going to follow that same sort of strategy that we had before. I'm going to try and uh, create a Turing machine for uh, ATM out of a Turing machine for this language, the one that I want to show is undecidable. And the way I'm going to do that is starting out in the same way. Let's start for uh, the sake of contradiction with our assumption that says let's assume it is decidable. Why are we doing that? So we can argue there's some uh, machine that decides it. I'm just using the, the name H again for like we did for halt. Like maybe we could use E here. It's just the name of the machine that decides it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build our new machine. I'm calling this one M1 and I'm going to use H as part of that machine. My new machine is going to look a little bit like this. Okay. On input MW, remember we're deciding ATM and so we need to have follow the input structure there. It takes a machine and a string. And what do we want to do? We want to accept if M accepts W and reject otherwise. So let's build our machine. Now what we're going to do is we're going to, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write down some some other machine's description. And here's this other machine. This is a machine M2. It's a very special machine. Um, the goal of this machine is I want this machine to have uh, either a empty language or a non-empty language and I want that to help tell me whether M decides on uh, whether M accepts W. So what I'm going to do for M2 is on any input I get, every input's the same, we treat every input the same, I'm just going to run M on W. Now remember we don't know if M's going to halt or not so we have three outcomes there. Either M's going to accept or it's going to reject. I haven't said what I'm going to do in that case, but it's assumed that we might will reject. Or it's going to run forever. Now, if it's going to run forever, we're going to run forever as well. M2 will run forever. So M2 is either going to accept every string or it's going to run forever or reject every string. And if it accepts every string, its language is going to be all the strings. And if it doesn't accept every string, its language is going to be empty. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run H on M2. Now remember what H can do is it can tell us if M2 has got an empty language or not. So if it accepts that means M2 had an empty language. If M2 had an empty language that means it, it must not have been accepting for every string. So if it, it, that was I guess step four, if it accepted will reject and if it rejects, if it says it's not the empty language, that means we did accept every single string and so we are going to accept in that case. So what we've created now is a machine M1 that M1 is going to hopefully decide. Let's see if we can, uh, sorry, decide uh, ATM. Let's see if we can argue that here. Let's review what we've set up so our argument's going to work here. So what do we know? M2, it's going to run M on W for every input X. So as we argued, its language will either be all of the strings or it's going to be none of the strings. When will it be all the strings? If M accepts W and it'll be none of the strings otherwise. So if we run H on M2, that's what we do here, it will reject M if M accepts W and it will accept otherwise. So if it rejects we, uh, M accepts W and we accept, otherwise we accept. So M1 accepts M and W if M accepts W, that's the definition of ATM, and it rejects it otherwise. So M1 must decide ATM. Again, that was the definition of ATM. This is our contradiction, and so our language ETM must be undecidable. Now, what we've been doing here in both of our languages, or sorry, both of our arguments so far, is we've been constructing what I've been calling a Turing reduction. So what a Turing reduction is, is a way to relate two different problems to one another. So I've got a little bit of a structure here. So say we want to have, we have some arbitrary language here, L, that we want to show is undecidable. And the way we're going to do that is you following this format uh, that we've been using for Turing reductions. Um, and so what we want to do is embed that, that language or rather a decider for that language inside of another machine that we're going to create. And that other machine is going, we're going to have to do some transformation sometimes of the output as well. Usually if we're transforming the output, we're just cross instead of if, if you accept, I accept we just cross over. If you accept, I reject like we did in that last example. But on the input, we usually sometimes have to do something like we did in that last example. We created this new machine M2. It was a special new machine. What was that? Well, we 
we needed to translate whatever the input is here, which is M and W, into whatever the input is for our language. In our case, it was just an M by itself, and, and languages can have arbitrary inputs. So um, I've left that sort of uh, uh, blank here because I don't know for an arbitrary L what the input's gonna be like, but what this mapping here is supposed to do is take this input here and turn it into something that helps us show that the uh, language ATM could be decided if we had a decider for this arbitrary language L. Now what's interesting about this is ultimately we're showing that both of these deciders can exist. We know that this decider on the outside can't exist. So if we can show that we can build it out of some other decider that we assume exists, then it must mean that this decider cannot exist either. And that's ultimately the goal here. So even though there, we're going to show there's a relationship between these problems, it helps us show that the, neither of these deciders actually exist. Now, formally, the way we could uh, write this is we could say um, one language, L1, reduces to another one. And we usually use this uh, sort of lowercase symbol here uh, to mean reduces to. If there's some mapping, some way to map them, uh, map strings, so M is a mapping, that means it's going to take as input a string, it's going to output another string, and it's going to uh, ha uphold this relationship. So if the string we put into our mapping W turned out to originally be in our first language L1, then whatever we map it to should still be in our, our other language L2, and then vice versa if it was not in the language. So if it was not in the language originally, whatever we map it to should also not be in the language. This is the general structure of what we call a reduction throughout computer science. We usually put on top of this idea some other constraints that uh, help us understand different kinds of reductions. And usually when we do that, we'll throw a subscript often on this lowercase symbol to remind you what it is. And so for my first example, I'm just going to show here the idea of a Turing reduction. So we might say a language Turing reduces uh, to another one. Uh, and then we'll throw the little subscript T on there. And what's the additional constraint? The additional constraint is that this mapping that we're talking about, MW, must be computable. It must not be some kind of strange uncomputable uh, mapping, for instance, one that maps Turing machines to whether they halt or not. That is a uncomputable mapping, and so we, we can't use that one. But that's a pretty... Uh, um, small constraint considering some of the other constraints that we might put on our Turing reductions or on our reductions in general. And so uh, this is still considered to be a very uh, general reduction. We might just call this a computable reduction. And um, again, uh, if we can find the, such mappings, that's all we need for the types of reductions we're using in those proofs that we've just created there. If we can Yes, if we can reasonably assume that a Turing machine could compute that mapping, then it's a Turing reduction and we can use that to show that languages are not decidable as we've just done. Uh, I mentioned, and I'm, so I'm going to give another example. Here's another one. It's called a polynomial time reduction or a Cook reduction uh, named after another researcher. Uh, this was a reduction that adds an additional constraint that the Turing computable mapping is also computable within polynomial time. So it doesn't take exponential time or some other uh, enormous amount of time to compute that mapping. If you have that, this helps us to define um, the set of MP complete problems, which is a important set of problems within the field of complexity theory, a field that was born out of the field of com computability, the one that we've been looking at in this series of videos. So I do want to finish with uh, an interesting sort of proof here that helps us show why Turing reductions are helpful in these undecidabil undecidability proofs. And that is this theorem here that argues that if we have a Turing reduction between language one and language two, and specifically if language one reduces to language two, and language one is known to be undecidable, then language two also is undecidable. And it's important for us to keep in mind here, if we want to prove this, we're always taking the one we know to be undecidable and reducing it to the one 
that we don't know. Sometimes that seems counterintuitive or backwards. We often we might want to do the reduction the other way sometimes. Uh, at least that's where my intuition often leads me. And I'll have to remind myself, no, I take the known one and I reduce it down to the unknown one, not the other way around. Um, I think the reason is in general, if we were actually trying to solve these problems, you're usually trying to solve the unknown one and you're going to use the known one as, uh, inside. We've got to flip that on its head for this type of reduction. And why do we need to do that? Because it's embedded in a proof by contradiction. So what we're actually trying to show is that this doesn't even ever work. And that's why we actually had to flip it on its head. Okay, so that's just to highlight some of the important uh, ordering of our languages in this theorem. Okay, known to be undecidable reduces to unknown. That will show the unknown one is undecidable as well. And now let's try and prove that. Okay, so let's assume that we have this reduction. And let's assume that L1 is actually undecidable. Okay, that's our setup. Then we have to show that L2 is uh, undecidable as well. So to get that started, we're going to do a proof by contradiction because all of our arguments so far have been proof by contradictions. So we'll assume that it is decidable. Now let M2, so now we're going to have L2 was decidable. So M2 will be the machine. That was the H that we've been using in our previous ones. We'll call it M2 in this case. Now what we're going to do is we're going to con construct this machine M. Now what this machine is going to do is try and uh, embody that uh, diagram that we saw earlier. So for M, what it's going to do as it computes input W, that's the string that's coming in for language one, we're going to compute the mapping that we know exists because we've assumed that it's Turing reducible. And what that's going to do is produce some output um, uh, MW and MW, uh, we can then run M2 on. Now, the important relationship that MW has is that if W, the original string, was in language 1, then MW will be in language 2. And since L2 is a decider for language 2, we know that it's going to tell us yes or no, and we'll halt on every input. It will tell us whether MW is in language 2. Well, the relationship that we had seen for uh, the Turing reduction shows then it's just told us whether W is in L1 and that's what we're trying to argue. Um, and what we've created here is a decider for L1 now and since we've got this decider for L1 but we have uh, well we can conclude it's decidable but that contradict contradicts our assumption up above that it was undecidable so L2 must be decidable. So this is a general structure that shows whenever, whenever you have this Turing reduction and you have the known one, the first one, to be undecidable, then you're going to have uh, a proof that the second one is undecidable. It kind of gives us a recipe to prove different languages are undecidable. And once we have that recipe, we can just practice it a little bit and we should be able to prove a number of different languages are undecidable. So. Uh, thanks a lot for watching this video. In my next video, I'll explore using this recipe a little bit. Thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you in that next video.